Ford's 10-speed rear-wheel drive transmission known as the 10R80. Now, just to be clear, everything stated in this presentation is as I understand the data that I have found as it relates to this 10-speed transmission. I certainly don't know everything about this unit, but much of the information that I have learned comes from one, uh, this book as pictured here on the slide by Bill Brayton, and two, ATRA has these uh, wonderful videos under their virtual training uh, segment. If you're a member of ATRA, you have access uh, to uh, service uh, repair videos to many six-speed, eight-speed, and nine-speed transmissions. Okay. First of all, a little history. Um, this is a this is was a joint venture to create uh, this ten-speed. In fact, General, Motor, General Motors and Ford got together and developed a 9-speed front-wheel drive unit and a 10-speed rear-wheel drive unit. Just like they did back in 2003, 2004, uh, 2005, whenever you know, that uh, really occurred. I think the talks started in 2003, but anyway, they, they got together and made 6-speed units. Again, both front-wheel drive and for rear-wheel drive. Now, uh, of course, the, the real reason was to save, you know, loads of money in research and development, as well as uh, offer vehicles with improved fuel economy and performance. Now, the 10 speeds uh, debuted a few in a few models like the Ford F-150 Raptor in 2017, but by 2018, uh, it, was getting, it was getting into other uh, vehicles in both the Ford and General Motors lineup. And by 2019, it was pretty much uh, standard equipment uh, in, in a lot of vehicles uh, by both companies. They, um, again, had already partnered up before. The six-speed units actually showed up uh, 2006, 2007. By 2008, they were really prevalent, be it a front-wheel drive uh, vehicle or a rear-wheel drive platform, you know, pickup truck, SUV. Um, again, they had the six-speed units. Now, let's be clear, clear about one other thing here. Each company manufactures their own transmissions in their own plants. And therefore, each company produces their own version. So, uh, they are not identical part for part, but they're the same, if that makes any sense. Uh, I don't know that the parts are that interchangeable but they are built, again, uh, in their own plants for their purposes, but the design, the design is the same, yes. Actual components, are they identical? No. Um, of course, the whole, what this offers the companies is uh, economy of, of scale, meaning uh, these, these transmissions are made uh, for several different vehicle uh, applications and, uh, which saves them, you know, lots of money because there's a lot of identical parts amongst, you know, the manufacturer itself. Now, each company also has their own software to obviously uh, control the transmissions operation based upon the individual vehicle application. Ford calls it the 10R80. I believe I've even heard uh, in re a reference to a 10R140, which must be for heavier duty, you know, three quarter tons. Uh, of course, the 10 stands for 10 speed, R for rear-wheel drive, and the 80 or the 140, depending on which number is used, is a torque rating. I don't believe 80 stands for this transmission could handle 800 foot-pounds of torque. I believe it's not really quite uh, that, that beefy of a transmission. It probably could handle four or 500 foot-pounds of torque. But that 80 is their own torque rating, and that's all I really know. General Motors calls this, uh, the, their version of this transmission, the 10L90. Again, the 10 for 10 speed, but they like to refer to uh, longitudinal as their rural drive platform. And again, they uh, use both the 80 or the 90. I've seen this transmission uh, listed either way. 
an 80 or a 90 uh, torque rating. And um, anyway, please also bear in mind that General Motors also has a deal with Allison who makes a 10 speed for their three quarter ton and one ton pickups starting probably 2020, if memory serves me right. So again, the, the this uh, first 10 speed we're talking about, the, be it the 10R80 or the 10L90, please don't confuse it with the Allison 10 speed that General Motors again uses in their heavier uh, duty pickups. Okay, uh, here's the uh, gear ratios. Uh, first gear, 4.7, that's a tall ratio. Okay, when we say tall, meaning that's a big number. Uh, it's a big number uh, when you compare it to one. So, you know, the input shaft is turning 4.7 times to the output shafts once. That's that's a, that's really a, a low gear, a tall ratio, however you want to look at that or phrase that. Uh, second gear, 3.1, you know, a lot of transmissions are about that in first gear. And uh, to give you an idea. Now, seventh gear is where we have a one-to-one -one or direct drive ratio. This 10-speed has three overdrives. That is amazing. I wonder how much it really operates in 10th gear. Probably uh, on the level with a tailwind or, or going downhill fast. <laughs> that would be my guess. And here's a couple of sources that talk about this joint venture. Um, if you'd like to refer to those, uh, General Motors Newsroom, you can probably just type in something about uh, uh, the joint venture of these 10-speed transmissions and such. Moving on. Now, something they have really simplified and made wonderful, in my opinion, is how they name the clutches. So there's clutch one or clutch two. Actually, it's clutch A, B, C, D, E, and F. There are six friction clutches. There's no bands in this transmission, but there are six friction clutches. Two of them, number one and two, are brake type clutches, okay? They're holding. When they're applied, they hold one of the planetary members to uh, the case of the transmission. The other four clutches are driving clutches. In other words, when they're applied, they are rotating. Power is being transmitted to a sun gear or a planetary gear set. Uh, I'm sorry, the planet pinion or the uh, uh, ring gear. And there is one mechanical one-way clutch. Okay, it's a mechanical roller one-way clutch. Those are the clutches. This transmission has four planetary gear sets. I believe they are all referred to as simple planetary gear sets. Um, again, the breakdown of the clutches, as I just mentioned, uh, six friction clutches in all, and again, one mechanical one-way uh, clutch. Valve body has two parts, an upper and a lower half. There are eight solenoids and a TCM, all bolted, located on the valve body. When you pull the pan, there it is. There, there's where it resides. Um, now, the clutches... The, you know, how they're uh, labeled or referred to as A, B, C, D, E, F. Well, the solenoids are designated the same. And, of course, a solenoid A would control clutch A. And solenoid B would control solenoid, or I'm, I'm sorry, clutch B and so forth. The shift solenoids are proportional, meaning when there's low current, and of course, in my example, I say zero current, uh, low current would give us low pressure. And if we get a maximum current, which is about eight, maybe 900 milliamps, that would allow maximum pressure to be applied to the clutches to, you know, force them together and hold. For maybe maybe you're under a heavy load or a hard acceleration to ever see that kind of pressure. And of course, cruising down the road, maybe you only you only need two or three hundred milliamps of current to send the proper amount of pressure. To the clutches. Remember, the TCM is nothing more than a big voltage control center, uh, taking voltage readings and then sending current, uh, so many volts to operate something, which in this case will impact hydraulic pressure to the clutches that operate the transmission. 
there are uh, there are two other solenoids besides the six I just mentioned. The seventh one is called the TCC lockup, okay, for the torque converter clutch. And this can occur, TCC lockup can actually occur in second gear and higher gears. But again, engine load must be right for this to occur. But it's it's uh, pretty amazing uh, how soon we lock up the converters as uh, compared to what we used to do in the four-speed world, which was only in drive and overdrive. And we had to be cruising to get to that point as well. So this is again pretty revolutionary as to how early we, we uh, lock up the converter the eighth solenoid in this transmission on the valve body is called the lpc or line pressure control solenoid but it operates inversely in other words low current delivers maximum pressure and there's a reason for this if we were to lose uh pressure i'm sorry if we were to lose electricity to the uh, transmission it uh, would deliver um, high pressure to the clutches. But as we'll point out later, this transmission is different from all others, at least up until this date, in how this all works. Uh, I'll, I'll explain uh, later. Please know it's normal for uh, this transmission to perhaps skip a shift. So if you see it shifting from first to third and from third to fifth, then it goes you know, six, seven, eight. Uh, if the load is light and it, the, the speed, you know, acceleration is kind of heavy, it's going to skip a few gears to get where it needs to be to operate effectively. And downshifting is the same way. It might skip, you know, from fourth down to second uh, on, on when slowing down. The shifts do not always occur in a linear fashion. And there's a YouTube right here that's uh, made by Ford and explains how this is normal. And uh, if you want to get that address and, and go view that, it's, it's your choice. Uh, there is no manual valve in this transmission. The manual valve is what we would always slide or move when we move the gear selector. You know how we push on the brake pedal and move it from park into reverse or to drive. Um, and it would uh, physically move a, a mechanical piece called the manual valve. Well, this transmission is all solenoid operated. So when we slide or move something now, or in the Dodge's case, you know, in case of some of the Dodge products, we just push a button. There's not even a lever to move anymore. Um, electrically, things are engaged or power is sent to the appropriate solenoids to apply the appropriate clutches to achieve first gear or reverse or, or whatever gear uh, is, is uh, you know, appropriate for that mode of operation. So here's the part that, again, uh, makes this transmission different as well. I should say another. When there's no power to the TCM, in other words, let's say you had a bad ignition switch and, and there's no power reaching the, the transmission control module or enough a couple of fuses that operate the transmission had blown okay well this allows no power to the shift solenoids and that allows them to be off and the vehicle will not will not move what we're saying is there is no fail safe mode for this vehicle in the past we've always had a, a gear that the transmission would you know default to if it lost power Often it was third gear. Some of the uh, six speeds, it was fourth or fifth gear. It makes them really gutless to start out with. Yes, but we can at least move the vehicle and get somewhere. And we'd always, we would always have reverse too. But this particular model, and I believe General Motors is doing the same. I don't know that for a fact. Um, if when there is no power to the TCM, this truck's not going to move. Engine might run, but again, it won't move. So, some diagnostic uh, helps and aids I wish to talk about now. There is a line pressure tap. It's the only uh, pressure tap on the side of the transmission. We take the tap out, screw in a pressure gauge, and test for hydraulic pressure. 
and this makes sense sometimes if we suspect you know that we got a we've got a, a a low or poorly operating transmission let's see if it's sound hydraulically or not okay and in this case you know the psi uh, settings or pressure readings are in parentheses so say we're in reverse at idle apparently this should measure um, 90 psi and if we put our foot on the brake and put the th throttle to the floor install pressure should go to 240. That, that's quite typical for a reverse uh, stall pressure reading for most any transmission really so here's here's this chart here if you ever need to do a pressure test you remove this plug and this plug ford's pretty clear about it does not use pipe thread it's using instead regular bolt type thread and of course there's an o-ring on this plug to prevent fluid leakage sometimes uh, you'll need to know some numbers or identification numbers on the side of the transmission and according to this picture or diagram there's a there's a code on this side of the trance that might need to be used for maybe some programming of, of the transmission. And on the other side, of course, would be some other uh, manufacturing plant information. And uh, likely this, this information wouldn't be used by a dealer or technician. This is just for manufacturing purposes and such. But uh, nonetheless, uh, these QR codes and part numbers do exist, again, Put there by the manufacturer of this unit. Steering operation. Um, of course, we have a transmission control module, right? And it's got some inputs from the transmission and some inputs coming into it from the vehicle's PCM. And all of these inputs impact shift solenoid A, shift solenoid B, shift solenoid C, what have you, or the line pressure control solenoid operation, or when we or when we engage the torque for the clutch. Now, some inputs from the uh, PCM that are critical for all of this to work together to have good transmission, you know, operation, smooth shifts, and so forth. Uh, map, uh, manifold absolute pressure throttle position uh, mass airflow uh, those are all critical inputs oh and vehicle speed sensor okay those would all be uh, very important signals to the tcm working along with these uh, uh, other speed sensors and transmission fluid temp sensor transmission range sensor okay all those working together again to know when to make shifts occur and how much line pressure, hydraulic pressure to deliver to clutches, and when do we apply the torque for the clutch or, or uh, disengage it. So that's what this yellow box up here is implying, that there's some inputs from the engine, because that's, gonna, that's obviously necessary, so the TCM knows when to make a shift, okay? Uh, throttle position engine load and vehicle speed are probably the three largest inputs of, of high priority, what have you, uh, to determine when we shift to transmission. Transmission te fluid temp and uh, these, all, these others all definitely come into play. Um, but some of these others like these, uh, these sensors down here, these, these bottom three or four, are also involved with diagnostics to see if a uh, a shift actually occurred or was uh, did the change the ratio from one gear to the next in a certain amount of time uh, indicating that things are either in good condition or in bad condition here's a, a slide I just included again uh, the, these these uh, items from the PCM okay engine speed engine torque accelerator position again this torque I think these two are very close related these are all going to help us understand, I'm sorry, these all have impact on the transmission shift scheduling, or, or in other words, when does it shift? And when would torque converter uh, clutch actually be applied? What would the line pressure be 
to the clutches, okay? So uh, these are the uh, TCM, I'm sorry, PCM inputs that would be fed to the TCM. Coolers are getting more complex. Um, in the past, transmission cooler lines would simply go up to the radiator inside the tank or maybe an external cooler in front of the radiator. But now we have this cooler warmer. And so when things are cold, the fluid hits this and warm engine coolant is going to uh, help warm up the fluid. And then when things get uh, warmed up, then we send the fluid out to uh, another segment to actually go through the cooler to get cooled off and send it back to the transmission. There's a thermostat in this setup and a bypass valve that blocks fluid from coming even out to the cooler warmer. Uh, if it thinks things are so cold, it, it'd be best off to warm up inside the transmission, but just like a cooling system on an engine, right? Things are getting more complex though. Now this clutch apply chart, very ha helpful in diagnostics. Maybe a, a vehicle comes in and uh, doesn't operate in third, fifth, sixth, and seventh gear. Okay, and you're like, well, wouldn't be clutch A because first and second work. We said third, fifth, sixth, seventh. Maybe it's clutch E. Oh, that also operates in first, doesn't it? <laughs> Bad example. But nonetheless, uh, what we do is we use this as a kind of like a um, process of elimination. Uh, we, we try to understand what modes will the transmission operate in and just maybe uh, what clutch is impacting uh, the particular gears that perhaps are not operational. Great, useful tool. Let me give you one. I'm going to try to give you another example. Let's say second gear. In order for second gear to occur, clutch A has to hold. That's a holding type. The rest, C, D, E, and F are all driving clutches, right? So um, if we were missing, um, say, clutch D, we'd still have clutch or, or first gear based upon those clutches. But if clutch D was a problem, uh, then we'd probably also be missing gears two, three, four, six, seven, because that's applied for those. If that clutch happened to fail, um, we would probably have fifth gear, okay, because that's not listed here. We'd have first gear, that's not listed here, eighth, ninth, tenth, but anyway, this is a fabulous chart. Now, the low uh, one-way mechanical clutch, one-way clutch, uh, it holds and is uh, actually utilized only in first and second gear, be it in drive, okay, in D, or manual. It's also used and keeps us and uh, helps us in first and second gear. OR means that's when this clutch gets overrun. It's not affecting or helping anything. It's just being overrun. It's rotating it's in the opposite direction from being a one-way lockup. And these other ranges, that particular uh, planetary gear set is probably not even rotating, so it's just idle. So that's a little, a little bit about this chart. The solenoid apply chart, the same thing. It's a process of elimination thing. And maybe we have a code dealing with uh, the uh, S, uh, C uh, clutch or the C solenoid for, this, for that matter in, in this example. And maybe uh, it's not turning on for second, third, fourth, uh, fifth, and seventh. And it doesn't need to be on for eighth and for first and for reverse. Okay, so there's this solenoid uh, application chart as well. Okay. Now something new at least for me is this transmission range sensor called the tr transmission range right it's comprised of a dual set of, of sensors meaning inside this little thing okay so this is where a shifting lever or uh, shaft used to go inside the side of the transmission and uh i'm not sure if something still moves this or not, I'm still getting 
and there with this transmission. But this is a dual sensor or redundant type sensor, just like a accelerator position pedal position sensor, a APP or a throttle position sensor, meaning one sensor reads one way, one reads the other in case half, you know, one side of the sensor failed, we'd still have a backup, okay? So what this chart down here means, when we're in reverse, for example, um, the minimum for sensor A is 35.5, and the uh, uh, maximum for sensor B is 64.5. And I think these two numbers add up to be 100 hertz, whereas the other side of sensor A, sensor B would work together to come up with 100 hertz as well. And if part of the sensor dropped out, this would probably be ignored. And it would go off this other set of values. So it's a redundant kind of a fail safe in case part of the sensor failed for whatever reason, which is sure a, a nice thing to do. <laughs> for vehicle operation. So here's D and sport. That's where you're down in the manual shifting mode, right? You pull the lever into uh, uh, where you can plus or minus the gear range. So, okay. Uh, more theory and operation. All I want to show on this slide is, is the location of some speed sensors. In the past, we had two, maybe three speed sensors and it, uh, in this case number two is the turbine shaft okay that, that's like the input shaft we're monitoring that speed and four is the output shaft speed sensor and uh the pcm in the past tcm in the past would say hey when a shift applies did a a, a a ratio change occur you know when a certain other set of clutches were applied did a ratio occur and between these two sensors, it could tell you, yes, a, a ratio changed or not. And it would set a code if it didn't see a change occur. Well, these other two sensors, these intermediate speed sensors, they're in place to, as I've listed down here, they are used to monitor clutch state. In other words, did the clutch actually engage? And this is for diagnos diagnosis of clutch condition. Did the shifts happen in a timely manner? So we have four speed sensors on this transmission. Two, again, are monitoring the clutch state or condition. And uh, the other two, the turbine and the output shaft, did the ratio actually occur? And again, these all four work together to help give us diagnostics and uh, help the transmission operate, uh, again, in, in a uh, functional way. The valve body, now, this was mounted here in this open cavity under the transmission pan. This is where the transmission pan bolts would be, right? Okay, so here's the valve body that would bolt to that open area. And here's my solenoids, uh, one through six. But again, they're actually referred to as shift solenoid A, B, C. So what they're showing here is the order. Number one is actually shift solenoid D. Number two is actually shift solenoid D. E, and so forth. Uh, our line pressure control has the blue connector. That's the one that uh, uh, impacts line pressure to the clutches. These over here just simply open and close pre uh, fluid pressure directed to the clutches. But this controls how much hydraulic pressure is actually sent through these. Okay. And of course, the green connector is the torque converter clutch solenoid. Those are the eight solenoids on the valve body. Uh, in case this uh, valve body was ever replaced, you will need apparently these uh, number this these numbers up here to uh, reprogram the TCM. Okay, otherwise it may not operate or operate uh, properly. Uh, something about the e uh, individual shift solenoids. I guess they too have these little operating numbers on the back side of the solenoid, right? And these are serviced separately, apparently. I think as time goes, this will become more common, perhaps. Well, I guess we'll find out. Um, but the back of these solenoids, the new replacement, if there's a number two on the old one, 
uh, this band number, you've got to have a number two on the new one. Or if it had a three or a four, if there was a four here, the replacement one needs to also have a four. I think that's understandable. This uh, CI, uh, CDAS uh, designation, casting integrated direct acting solenoid. Don't sure what that means exactly, but uh, that's the technology term that, that uh, these solenoids are referred to, uh, referred by at times. Now, the line pressure control solenoid, again, this is the one that acts inversely or opposite compared to all other solenoids on the valve body. So let's understand this picture. Uh, when there's high current sent to this solenoid, it exhausts more fluid uh, out, okay, the, to escape. Therefore, a lower uh, amount of pressure is sent. So lower PSI to the regulator valve. Yeah, is sent to the pressure regulator valve that operates the hydraulics of the transmission. Um, I know the pintle isn't really moved differently here. Sorry for the bad um, artwork on Ford's behalf. <laughs> but when there's low current, then we get high pressure sent to the regulator valve. So again, this, this is controlling hydraulic pressure to each of the transmission's clutches when that particular clutch is selected. And of course, this is all really based on engine load. The higher the load, the more pressure will get sent to the clutch or clutches for that shift. As maybe I should have pointed out earlier, um, note that in this second gear, for example, there are three hydraulic clutches applied and one mechanical cl clutch in action to have that gear range. Third gear, we have four hydraulic clutches applied, one holder, three drivers. Fifth gear, one holder, again, three drivers. Sixth gear, one holder, three drivers. Eighth gear, one holder, three drivers. I hope you get the idea three, four clutches in this transmission's case, looks like for the most part, four clutches need to be applied and in good condition in order for a particular gear range to actually work. Okay. Okay. Uh, the torque converter clutch solenoid, it's the same kind of a solenoid, but it doesn't work inversely. It's proportional. So, Low current, low PSI is sent to uh, to this circuit. Probably not enough to apply the clutch, right? Uh, to disengage it, I guess. And then, of course, a high current, when, when it's sent to this clutch, it applies higher uh, fluid pressure to the converter clutch to engage it. Service information, this transmission uses what's known as Mercon ULV. Uh, ultra low viscosity, okay? At this time, I don't believe there's any universal fluid that will work in its place. So you better make sure you're using Mercon LV. Uh, using Mercon SP uh, could cause damage uh, to this transmission. SP is a common fluid used in the six speeds. And LV, not ULV, LV is also used in some of the six speeds. So, got some fluid uh, types to watch out for. 12 quart capacity, I'm told, is what this transmission between the converter and, and everything that's in the transmission and the cooler, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's about a 12 volt or a 12 quart <laughs> capacity. Fluid level check. Uh, the fluid needs to be at this temperature. Use your scan tool to get the tra transmission fluid temp and then check. The fluid level, I get this, after selecting each gear for six seconds. So you'll put your foot on the brake. Sorry for the misspell. Foot on the brake. Uh, put it in park. You'll put, put it in neutral or reverse or drive or sport. Each position for six seconds. Then get out and you will pull a little plug on the side of the transmission and pull a little dipstick. 
We'll show you what that little dipstick is in just a moment. But ideally, the fluid level should be in the middle or what they call segment B. Okay. The transmission cooler or cooling system includes a warmer. We already talked about that. Sorry. So here's the dipstick. Here's segment B. Here's segment A. Here's segment C, I assume. They want the fluid level in this little area. And note where it's located. You'll spin what looks like a big bolt, probably. You'll spin it out. And this is on the side of the transmission. This is the bell housing. And running right down beside this guy is the catalytic converter and hot exhaust system. It's wonderful. You're supposed to get it hot then put a glove on and I guess reach up in there and check the fluid level. It's, uh, it's a fun thing to do. And this is where you add fluid too. You'll have to reach up in here with some kind of a pump on the end of a hose or something and pump in the fluid. Back to uh, underneath the valve body on the transmission case, you know, underneath the pan, and the valve body's been removed. We've got some air check uh, places, and we'll show you what these are in lab. Um, item one or port number one, uh, if you put 40 psi of air pressure with this transmission assembled, with the valve body missing, you could apply air here and see if the clutch actually applies. You can hear for the clunk, okay? And of course, port two is for clutch B. Port two is over here. And clutch, th or clutch uh, C is number three, and so forth. What's nice about this is you can uh, perhaps do some air checks before the transmission was actu actually ever removed. You could pull the pan and the valve body and do some air checks in the vehicle and help you to, to help you determine is the problem with a particular clutch or shifting problem, what have you, is it in the transmission with the clutches or is it a, a valve body? This can help you rule out, is it a mechanical hydraulic issue or should I look towards the valve body and solenoid uh, potentially uh, being the issue? Handy things to uh, be aware of, okay? Uh, picture, I should say, this diagram is quite valuable even on assembly. Uh, when we get the insides of the transmission all put in, before you put the valve body on, on the bench, you can air check and make sure each clutch, you know, has a good clunk to it. Does it apply? If air is escaping and the clutch doesn't actually apply, you know something didn't get put in to get put together right, be it a seal um, or, or, what, or what what have you. Okay. Oh, come on. All right. Um, here's, a, I think, an important set of charts. Um, when we're putting the clutches together to see if we've got the right clutch clearances that we'd make with our feeler gauges, okay? Uh, those are the clutch clearances uh, for each clutch. And uh, there are some selective uh, snap ring thicknesses. If we need, if, if the thickness isn't quite right, we can get a thicker or thinner big old snap ring for that clutch assembly. Kind of neat. Okay. Um, torque uh, specifications, you know, the front cover bolt, uh, the pan bolts. 89 inch pounds, uh, filter bolts, 93 inch pounds. Okay, all, all of these various different torque uh, we need to know about. Okay, and that's this will conclude the uh, explanation of this. We'll now uh, have a video in regard to actually tearing down this transmission and putting it back together to, to some degree or another anyway. And uh, some of the specialty tools used in this video are listed here. Thank you and uh, see you in the next video for the teardown and assembly portion.